Hey everyone, welcome to chapter six, equipment selection and acquisition, a very, very fun thing to do with your green industry business. You get to go out and purchase these new toys. It's a fun thing to do and there's nothing like hearing uh, from your CPA or accountant that you need to spend some money and you get to go out and buy these new toys. So let's go ahead and get started uh, with chapter six. So the first question is whether or not do you need the piece of equipment or can you afford the machine? Now, like I just told you in the beginning slide, you know, there's going to be times when your accountant tells you that you have to spend money. They're going to come to you in December and say, Hey, look, you got to get rid of some of this cash that you've been making all year. So go buy that piece of uh, equipment that you've been wanting or a new truck. Now, if that's not what's being told to you from the accountant, you probably need to think about it. Can you afford it? And do you really, really need it? Does the equipment do the work quickly or rapidly? Do you need that bigger mower so that you can get done faster? Well, maybe not necessarily a bigger mower. Maybe you need two smaller pieces of equipment. Will the equipment save you time and labor? Usually it does. And in today's market where help is hard to, uh, to come by and everybody would rather uh, sit at home and, you know, live off their stimulus checks instead of out there working, um, you may want to go ahead and, and buy this new piece of equipment. Um, because it can help you get the jobs done quicker. And new equipment does eliminate workers. So uh, you got to you gotta really sit down and think about it. Does your company work at different types of properties? So you need to have that piece of equipment that's going to, um, you know, satisfy all the properties. You, you can't buy one machine just to satisfy one piece of property. It needs to be able to be used on all of your sites. Are you working at a large site all week or are you doing multiple uh, residential jobs per day and per week? Are you working in a small geographic location? Are you going to have to do some traveling? Well, you've got to take all of that information into consideration when you are purchasing uh, that new equipment. Some common equipment selection mistakes, in no particular order though, this is directly out of your book, not purchasing commercial quality equipment. When you're in the green industry and you're working for other people, you need to buy commercial equipment. You can't go to the big box stores and buy the homeowner uh, string trimmer or lawnmower. It needs to be commercial. Make the purchase decision on price alone. Sometimes it's better to buy that more expensive uh, equipment because it's going to last you longer. And it's just, um, uh, for one, there's parts for it. It's serviceable. You don't have to, uh, wait two weeks to get parts in, you know, your dealer has all the parts. So, uh, you, you may want to spend a little bit more money purchasing over or underpowered machines. You know, it needs to fit the type of properties that you're doing. You definitely don't want to be underpowered, but if you're overpowered, uh, that's probably uh, a whole lot better than being underpowered. Selected machinery from two different mini, uh, two different mini uh, manufacturers. Uh, parts are not interchangeable and the parts inventory becomes unmanageable and an economic burden. So buy from the same dealer. And basically when you're purchasing equipment, the dealer is probably the most important thing you need to consider. Are they going to be able to service your equipment? Are they going to have the parts there? You might be a John Deere fan. You might be a Skag fan. Uh, but you know, Toro has been well known in your area and the dealer there is just phenomenal and can provide you with the quality of service that you need. Uh, failing to obtain pre-purchase demonstration on your site with your personnel. You need to have uh, the dealers bring out some demo equipment. Not considering fuel source, whether it's two cycle or four cycle, gasoline versus diesel, and purchasing the wrong one. Now, we run both diesel and gas machines. Uh, we run our Walker mowers uh, that are diesel, and then we run our Skag Turf Tigers, uh, our V-Rides, or push mowers or walk behinds, they're all gas. The walker, uh, we just prefer that diesel motor in that machine. Failing to consider the machine size and weight for maneuverability, transportability, and employee fatigue. If your employees are getting tired throughout the day, they're not going to be operating the equipment as efficiently as they should. Not checking with other managers to confirm the sales pitch and then relying slowly upon the brand name. 
I'm I'm guilty of that. Like I love Walker, I love Skag, and I love John Deere. That's pretty much all we run. But I may need to look at some other types, you know, down the road. Is equipment being used daily under stressful situations and environments? Well, pretty much mowers are. And is the equipment being bought um, going to be seldomly used or just periodically? Then maybe you should consider just renting the piece of equipment when you need it. Buying used equipment and selling used equipment. Well, when buying it, you got to compare. Do not buy the first unit evaluated. Compare the models, brands, machine quality, service, and warranty. Try it. Ask the dealer if you can try it out. They're not going to let you try it out for a few days. They're going to maybe let you have it for a few hours. You need to look, develop a checklist, and inspect the general appearance, engine oil, air cleaner, fuel tank, electrical system, drive system, gearbox, safety equipment, and other crucial areas. Has a machine received proper care and service, or is it dirty where it shouldn't be? Ask, obtain a complete service and repair record. If purchasing the unit from a dealer, obtain the name of the previous owner, contact him or her. The dealer refuses to provide this information. Keep looking. Help. Have the machine inspected by a trustworthy mechanic if purchasing from an individual and obtain a reasonable warranty or service agreement from a dealer. It's going to be hard on used equipment. You know, unless you're dealing with a larger dealership, you know, the big name stores, mom and pop shops probably aren't going to be able to do that for you. If you're selling used equipment, determine the value, consult the blue book and determine the local market for the unit. Timing, used equipment brings higher prices just before or during the normal season, especially if it's ready to go. Then quality, make all the necessary minor repairs, tighten the loose bolts, change the fluids, have the service history and records available, spiff up the unit. Many buyers associate cleanliness with quality, and a cone of paint does hide a multitude of sins, but buyers are also well aware of this. With size, labor is more costly, um, than the machine, it should say in the machine there, so my fault. Larger equipment will do the task more rapidly. Now, I don't see going out and buying this piece of equipment for residential. No, we used to have a wing mower. It wasn't the John Deere, but we ran a lot of front mount John Deere's like that, uh, starting off with the 945 series and then moving up to the 1145 series, front mount mowers. This is a wing mower used primarily on golf courses. This was something that you would cut the fairways with, or you see the school systems use mowers like this to cut, you know, large acre properties, and they have, you know, many schools to cut. But, you know, you don't want to invest a $50,000 machine to cut residential guards like this. You need to determine the mower productivity. Productivity is the measure of the rate at which work can be performed, and mower manufacturers publish productivity information in acres per hour as part of product specifications. You can determine the area that a mower will cut in an hour by knowing the speed and mowing width. And so your acres per hour is your cutting width in inches times the speed in miles per hour divided by 100. This figure is based on straight ahead mowing with no allowance for overlap, stops, turns, slopes, maneuvering, or obstacles. This is just straightforward mowing. Your power source, is it diesel, gasoline, two cycle, four cycle, or propane? You know, the first two and the last one there uh, is going to be for your mowers. And here you see a propane mower, which is pretty, you know, neat. Uh, it's something that you can use in your marketing scheme that, you know, you're not burning diesel or gas, that you are burning propane. Um, I haven't really tried one, so I don't know that, you know, the comparison, but, you know, diesel is still going to be the best motor all around. Uh, but some of these gas motors are, you know, um, doing really well, just depending on the size of the mower. So it's all up to you. You need to get a feel for them. You know, are you more comfortable with diesel? Or are you more comfortable working on gas motors? Um, it's all based on that. Your two cycle and your four cycle, that's going to be like your weed eaters, your blowers, your hedge trimmers, and things like that. Consumer concerns about power equipment are real. Excessive noise from landscape maintenance power equipment uh, is a concern nationwide. California is the vanguard of the anti-blower and the other anti-power equipment, uh, as well as just about everything else movements. Your national, state, and local landscape groups and organizations have been and will be instrumental in keeping bans and restrictive ordinance to a minimum, but the success of organizations comes from the membership. If you're not willing to join and help, 
do not complain. And I stand by that. If, if you're going to sit back and complain about all this stuff, um, and you're not chipping in and doing your part, then you have no right to complain. Quieter technology will be developed and may be a partial solution, but only if it is purchased and used, it will cost you more. Professional manners and common sense are a large part of the solution and are essential, and common sense is free if it is used and expensive if it is ignored. Service is as important as price, just like I told you. You know, you got to have that dealer that's going to back you up, and it needs to be a well-known dealership can't be the new startups because they're not going to have the resources. They're not going to have the, the personnel that's going to be able to, uh, to do this equipment for you. They got to have parts. They got to have warranties on their machines and they've got to have mechanics on duty that can get it turned quickly. And another thing is if you're bringing some of your equipment to be worked on, do they have a loaner for you to use while your yours is getting repaired? They need to be able to supply you with something while your machine is down. Because downtime costs you money, and money is time. Information, the worst time to buy a piece of equipment is when you need it. So you need to go to trade shows, you need to subscribe to magazines, and you need to visit the dealers. Here you can see something that looks like the, uh, um, the GIE, the Green Industry Expo. And once you get established in your career, or you know, even this coming October, head up to, to Louisville, Kentucky go ahead and Google the Green Industry Expo. It is the largest trade show uh, for landscape professionals, horticulture professionals. Every piece of equipment you can imagine is there, costs you 15 bucks to get into the, the trade show. It opens up on a Wednesday around three o'clock, runs till uh, seven or eight Wednesday night, and then it's there all day Thursday and all day Friday. So, you know, you got two and a half days of trying out every piece of equipment, it costs you 15 bucks to get in, uh, but you'd have to travel and get your hotel. Operators, uh, allow your crew leaders to test out the equipment. The operators must have time to acclimate to the equipment to reach acceptable production rates. They, you need them to try it. You being the owner, yeah, you want to you wanna go out there and run it the first few hours, whatever, but if you're not going to be running it every day, it needs to be your personnel that are going to run it, that are testing it out. With specifications, write the specs with a unique feature of a brand that you like to have for the property. I mean, if you're if you're into SCAG, study those specs, write your specs that you would need for the property. There's no reason to buy a ride-on mower for a particular property. Let's say it's a large acreage um, condominium complex that you're taking care of, and it's all heels. Well, you definitely don't want to buy a walker mower for that, and you don't want to want buy a turf tiger from SCAG. You'd probably need to either buy the, the V-Ride or you would want to do a walk behind mower. So you got to know your specs for each property. Replacing existing equipment, you need to compare cost. Productivity does make you money. Uh, old machines are going to be obsolete. You're not going to be able to find the parts or people that really want to work on them. And you need to be able to have parts in your shop uh, for the small stuff. And, you know, pretty good uh, little machine here, you know. Uh, and this was a young man or young woman, probably back in the days that, that did make some money, uh, doing something like this consumer concerns. Uh, well, we've already seen that. So we're going to have to skip that. I don't know why it's in there again. Uh, but professional manners, reduce noise complaints, operate blowers at the lowest possible throttle setting, use blowers or noisy equipment at reasonable hours. Don't be walking down a neighborhood sidewalk at 630 in the morning on a Saturday blowing off debris. I mean, you're going to make some people mad. Keep 10 feet away from doors and windows when using blowers. Avoid open windows where dust and noise might be a nuisance. Use only one blower at a time on small residential sites. Use full blower extension to work close to the ground it's going to actually kind of you know draw it to the ground almost like suck it down there keep dust to a minimum and use rakes and brooms where appropriate alternative fuel sources propane and electric i know electric mowers is a big big thing that is going on and uh, i think we're going to see more of it in the green industry to be honest with you to buy or not to buy should you own it or should you lease it i'm all about purchasing the equipment 
Um, when you lease something, we've, we've leased, uh, some trucks before. And then the residual that's left at the end, it's just, it's like having another truck payment. Um, so I'd much rather purchase it, but you can lease it if funds are tight and you're just getting started. Um, you're able to lease it and have that lower monthly payment. And then what it is, you just turn it in once the lease is up and you go and get a new machine. That's the cool thing about it is when you lease something and it's up, you can turn it in and get a new one and just start the lease all over again with your shops. Um, you need to have a nice facility to work on your things. You need to have parts inventory. You need to keep things like belts, drive belts, um, the, the oil that it takes blades, mower blades. You need to keep air filters, oil filters, um, you know, maybe some tubes for the tires. If you get it flat, you need to have all of that there ready to go. Maybe you'll have an on site mechanic. We used to years ago, we'd have a, a mechanic that would come in in the evenings that would actually sharpen all of our blades, change the oils and get everything ready for the next day. And you've got to keep maintenance records and having that mechanic on staff, you know, that is one of their responsibilities is to keep up with these records. If not, it's going to be you. Uh, but if, if you're not going to do it in-house, let the dealers do it and they're going to maintain these records for you. It's going to be in their computer system. Um, equipment for the crews, a uh, good thing to have in the truck is a small tool kit, uh, first aid kit always, and then keep a few spare parts in the truck, like, you know, shear bolts on a Walker. That's always going to break, uh, your drive belts, your, your, your blade belts. That's going to run, uh, the actual blade. So, um, you know, keep these there and that's a nice looking, uh, craftsman tool set there. Employee safety you know, is job number one for everyone. Everyone using equipment should read and be familiar with the operator's manual, handle the fuel carefully and safely, use well-marked proper safety containers and make sure the right fuel is added to the tank. Be prepared for emergencies. A first aid kit in every vehicle is a must. Keep safety shields in place. Keep your rollover protection in place and make sure all safety devices are in place and working. Never bypass the dead man switch, never smoke while refueling or operating equipment, and never operate the equipment when impaired by illegal or illegal substances. Check the equipment every day before operating, service the tire safely and maintain proper pressure, and check the areas for debris before mowing or operating the equipment and wear your protective clothing, your PPE. Loose fitting clothes, long slacks, and closed toe shoes with traction soles reduced injury. And then your earplugs and ear must reduce uncomfortable noise and protect your hearing. Never carry riders, wear seat belts if finished. And let's take it back that look, look at that last one. Never carry riders. I see so many times grandpa with his little grandchild on his lap actually mowing. It is the most dangerous thing you can do. It takes one little mistake and you're thrown off and it may not kill you, but you're going to lose some fingers or toes underneath that blade. But for a small child, it could definitely kill them. Uh, do not run engines and doors and look before backing up and then lower all implements before storing a machine and display a safety triangle or slow moving vehicle sign when operating equipment on or near the roads. Avoid steep hillsides, ravines, and other risky areas where machines could slip and tip over. Be extra cautious when mowing or operating equipment near roadsides or in boulevard strips. Discharge clippings away from the traffic and be alert and cognate of pedestrians, especially children attracted to the machines. And so, guys, that does conclude uh, Chapter 6 in Professional Landscape Management. Thanks, guys, and I'll see you in the next lecture.